morning, good afternoon everyone. So yeah, spectrum sharing, we hear a lot about spectrum sharing and we hear a lot about spectrum. And um, so what I want to do actually is talk about spectrum, but specifically why is it so important? Why are we always talking about spectrum as, as something that's important? Other things are important. Electricity, you need electricity for example to, uh, to, to, run, a, to run a cell site. Well electricity is important too, but we're always talking about spectrum. So why is that? What's so important about spectrum? Or what's so special, actually, about spectrum? And then I want to talk about the challenge for these uh, hard to reach or, or extreme, as Mansour said, and we've used the term extreme rural areas as well. What is, the, what is the thing that's so difficult for these rural areas? And then I'm going to talk about spectrum sharing. And, and, uh, and I won't uh, have enough time to go into a whole load of uh, um, the different possibilities of how to share spectrum in depth, but I do want to touch upon some of the, the terminology. We're hearing dynamic and, 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 and you know, sharing and so on. I want to talk about what kinds of, uh, let's say, uh, dimensions there are to, to spectrum sharing or what the variables are. Uh, what are the benefits of sharing spectrum? And spectrum and maybe other infrastructure as well, because spectrum can be thought of as a piece of the infrastructure. Um, and, then, uh, and then I want to talk about some of the spectrum uh, sharing activities within 5G Rural First itself. And then I'll kind of uh, talk about next steps, what I think next steps uh, may be or, or may be needed. And then uh, we'll, we'll, we'll wrap up with a conclusion. Okay, so um, spectrum. Well, what is it? Uh, so we talk about spectrum radio waves, right? Radio waves, and we always talk about spectrum. Well, I suppose what we're really talking about, or we divide the radio waves up into different frequencies of use, and uh, different frequencies have uh, have different properties, and that makes them good for different things. So, for example, within the 5G context, we do uh, quite often keep hearing about three uh, three particular bands, which are the 5G bands. We've got a kind of uh, low frequency, well, uh, that's, a low fre that's a relative term, it's sub 1 gigahertz frequency, 700 megahertz, round about there, a band of uh, frequencies at around about 700 megahertz. Then we hear about the so-called mid frequencies, the sort of 3.5 three gigahertz or thereabouts. And then we hear about uh, millimetre wave up at the kind of 26 or 28 gigahertz, that kind of, that kind of frequency. And these have all got kind of different properties that make them suitable for different types of things. And so, for example, in the chart here on the left, we have a frequency going up the, the vertical axis. So um, at the, at the, uh, the high frequency, we have, a, uh, we have a... I've actually got one of these uh, laser pointer things, but I don't know if I can, I don't know if I can do that. Uh, no, I don't. I don't have the laser pointer. On the, on the chart on the left-hand side... Um, the the uh, the three the three kind of dots or the three the three circles there the one on the left not near the top of the chart that's the high frequency one relatively small uh, um, range and uh, and then you kind of come to the middle one well it's got a bit of a bigger range and you come to the one uh, uh, down uh, the the bottom right of the graph and it's the kind of sub gigahertz that's the 700 megahertz a bit more range and when I talk about range I'm talking about for uh, equal uh, uh, transmit power. You can always in, you can always increase the range by you know upping the transmit power, but keep it you know for, for a given transmit power you've got different properties. So that's fine. And by the way, sometimes you don't want, depending on the application, you don't really want a lot of range. Sometimes you actually might want to contain the uh, the transmission to within a room, in which case you don't want it to go through walls and things like that. So the kind of the the, the millimeter wave stuff's uh, really good for that. But of course in a lot of the applications, in particular most of the rural type stuff that we're talking about, you probably are wanting the, the, the range, the coverage, and the lower the frequencies, the, the lower frequencies such as sub one gigahertz are kind of good for that. But over on the right hand side, there's, a, there, there's a, another kind of uh, visualization. And this, uh, th this came, I hadn't really realized this, I hadn't really thought about it this way until uh, Stuart Revel from uh, Surrey, I don't know if Stuart was, I think Stuart might be in the audience somewhere, is. Uh, Yes, yeah, Stuart. Stuart kind of uh, put, put it this way, that uh, if you visually, that this is actually drawn to scale on the right hand side, the bandwidth that's actually available in each of those uh, frequency bands. So at the top, we've got quite a lot of bandwidth in the green, the green bar up at the 26 gigahertz band. That's going to go from 24.25 to 27.5 uh, 
that says hertz, it should be gigahertz. So that's a 3.25 gigahertz uh, bandwidth, right? Three point, you can shove a lot of data through a 3.25 gigahertz uh, channel. And then we come down to the mid-frequency, around about the kind of 3.5 gigahertz, and say we've got 400 megahertz of bandwidth available there. And that's the yellow, uh, that's the yellow uh, bar. And then we get the 700 megahertz band. And we've essentially got, well, it depends how you look at it, it's, say, 60 megahertz of bandwidth, or two, 30 meg up, 30 megahertz down. So, and that's the red, uh, the red bar. But you can see when it's drawn to scale, it really highlights the, uh, the difference in bandwidth that's available at those frequencies. And that's another uh, issue, I suppose, or, or, or factor that has to be taken into account when you're looking at spectrum and properties and, uh, and actually how much bandwidth have you actually got available. Anyway, so it's an important thing, it's an important consideration. Spectrum is an important consideration. And the rural challenge is that connect rural connectivity is extremely challenging. And one of the main reasons that we've, and we've heard uh, already several times today is that it's difficult to make the business models work. And the reason for the making the, it being difficult to make the business models work, well, there's a number of reasons, I guess, but essentially, if you're thinking about coverage uh, of, uh, you know, uh, uh, residents and uh, residential premises and business premises, it kind of boils down to population density. It kind of boils down to how many uh, customers do you have per, uh, per unit of area, square kilometre, square mile, whatever. And the graph on the right-hand side, I'm not going to go into all of this in great detail, but what that graph shows is some uh, interesting uh, statistics um, about the population distribution within the UK. You know, 60% of the population actually is in uh, just 10% of the land mass. And, and then you can, you can go further along that graph and you'll see that things like, you know, 90% uh, you know, of the population um, is, is, is in, uh, you know, a, a kind of very, very small, or not very small, but a, a, a less than 50% of the land mass anyway. And that means that when you do go to the outlying areas, those rural areas, the remote rural areas, you actually don't have the population densities, hence the business models, the return on investments, uh, are, are the difficult thing. And, um, and then in the second bullet point there, I've said, well, another thing is lack of affordable access to spectrum is a key barrier to, to deployment. That's very true. But that in itself, as Mansour has pointed out, that in itself doesn't actually solve the, the, the business model uh, challenge. That doesn't really solve that return on investment uh, issue. But what it does do is it does have an impact on when, let's say, communities or alternative providers want to uh, provide coverage in those areas where the, where the main operators are not uh, deploying for commercial reasons, well, even if they have kind of worked out a way of kind of making a, a business model for them work, and it may well, someone mentioned, I think Des might have mentioned altruistic you know, communities who are, you, you do get the, the, the situations where the communities are kind of looking to self-help and so on, and that's kind of how the business models work. Well, even in those cases, if they can't get access to spectrum, then uh, it's not going to, you know, it doesn't matter how, how you're going to solve the business model challenge. You, if you don't have access to spectrum uh, and affordable access to spectrum, then it's, uh, it's not going to happen. So anyway, you know, so one of the things that you can be looking at and we're looking at is sharing of resources, including spectrum, but other things as well. You know, the neutral hosting that Des spoke about and, and, and roaming is, an, and these are all kind of forms of sharing. You can share the actual metal work, the towers themselves. Sharing of resources, but including spectrum, is one of the areas that has potential to, to yield benefits here. But it does require a new approach because it's not, the, it's not been the traditional way of, of, of thinking. But interestingly, we, we have, I mean, we are hearing, and, and actually we're being uh, very encouraged actually by uh, the, the, the recent. Uh, uh, announcements by by both Ofcom and DCMS and the UK government about the the uh, the, the, the the plans and, and the, the the options for um, sharing of spectrum and uh, and uh, and making spectrum more uh, affordably available in the the, the 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 hard to reach rural areas. So there's lots of there's lots of interesting and encouraging uh, things happening there, but it does require a new approach. Uh, relative to what we've been doing over the past several decades. So the benefits would be, well, what's the spectrum opportunity? Well, I've kind of 
kind of described it. I mean, this chart just shows where we are with spectrum. On the left-hand side, we have licensed spectrum, so that's the kind of traditional approach. You apply, you know, a mobile operator, for example, or other other type of uh, um, uh, operator will apply for a license and get a license to use spectrum. And by the way, the licensed model, licensed spectrum management model, will uh, continue to be required. That's not going to go away. There are uh, very good reasons why the licensed model works in, in lots of situations. And then over on the right-hand side, we've got license exempt spectrum, and that's something we're all familiar with, with Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, all of that stuff. We don't need to go to, we don't need to apply for a license to use our Wi-Fi routers in our homes just as well, because it would be, it'd be kind of difficult for us all to be doing that. It's license exempt spectrum. And you know, 15 or 20 years ago, would anyone really have thought about or, or, or predicted just how much Wi-Fi, for example, would have really taken off and been, uh, uh, you know, got to the point where we're really so dependent on it? It's, it's really uh, license exempt spectrum has been has fostered a lot of really good, uh, innovative um, uh, benefits for us all. And in the middle of all of that is what we're saying: shared spectrum. So what we're saying is, you've got the licensed spectrum, you've got the licensed. Uh, uh, user of that spectrum, but where they're not deploying it, well, why, why, why not allow other people to use it while the license holder isn't isn't using it? And the license holder's got to have first call on it. That, that's kind of that's kind of uh, almost obvious. Although we should probably state that, but if they're not using it, and by the way, lots of license spectrum is not being used, uh, you know, in, in various parts of the country. Lo there's lots of unused licensed spectrum. Uh, and so, anyway, so if we can work out ways of putting that to good use, we improve the overall spectrum utilization. That's the idea. And there's lots of, you know, we, we, Bob mentioned TV white space. That's kind of one area where the use of unused spectrum is, 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 um, is of potential benefit. And the exact same principles are actually being used in the what's known as CBRS, Citizen Broadband Radio Service, that's uh, developing uh, well, at the moment, mainly in the US, but a lot of the principles of that are kind of being looked at elsewhere, including uh, in Europe as well. And we do have uh, uh, the beginnings of a spectrum uh, sharing framework that's being talked about uh, here in the UK within government and Ofcom as well. And the key thing for us is, in 5G rural first, we've kind of said this uh, right from day one, 5G is an opportunity to do things differently. It's an opportunity to be looking at these types of things in a way that is not going to make 5G simply an extension of 4G or 3G or 2G. It's actually an opportunity to do things differently. And in fact, if we don't do that, then 5G will just become an extension of 4G and actually all the, the same problems are just going to exist and we're not going to solve any of them. So 5G is an opportunity to do things differently in order to uh, resolve or at least uh, somewhat alleviate a lot of these issues. Okay, so what are we doing in 5G Rural First as far as that's concerned? Well, you know, we've got three test bed sites. We've got Shropshire, Somerset, and we've got Orkney. And the spectrum sharing stuff that we're doing is, is, is on Orkney. And actually, we're doing a lot of things on Orkney. And, and the, the, the map on the right-hand side uh, here shows um, the, uh, basically shows the network that, that, that we've deployed on Orkney. And it stretches from uh, down in the south, um, where you see the red lines uh, coming through, so, so the red line coming up from the bottom of the graph, the red line coming up from the bottom is the subsea fibre coming into uh, um, uh, Shifa, uh, project partner Shifa's uh, subsea fibre uh, point of presence, POP. And, uh, and the network stretches uh, some, uh, actually the, the width of the, the Orkney Islands is it's something like 40 miles by about 60 miles high. So it's, it's a fair old spread. Orkney actually is deceivingly large. You know, we don't really see that. When we look at the map of the UK and we see those little islands at the top, they don't look that large, but they actually are. And so right at the very top, we have, uh, we have some, uh, some deployments by Parla Wireless. We have uh, on Stronzi, the island uh, just, uh, hopefully you can see Stronzi there, we have the BBC doing some 5G broadcast trials. 5G broadcast of, of radio, uh, commercial radio. And then there's various other, other trials we have, as we've heard, we'll have, we'll have Li-Fi. We actually have beam forming at uh, millimetre wave 
uh, basically uh, providing connectivity to a moving ferry and tracking the ferry as it, as, as it moves and so on. Um, but what we, uh, and all, the whole lot actually does uh, collapse onto that fibre pop at, uh, at Shifa's uh, centre at uh, Air of Cara. And, you know, we've been, uh, as a project, we've been very busy uh, doing lots of things, but there's lots of uh, installation activities been going on, lots of design, and uh, uh, before that, of course, installation activities going on. And the, um, these are photographs of some of the installation activities, but the map in the, in the bottom, the map at the bottom, just in, in near the centre, um, that's a map of basically Orkney mainland. And you probably can't really see it that well, but it's actually showing some coverage plots uh, of, of a kind of, of drive testing that we've been doing, um, specifically for use on a, uh, on, on a set of tour buses for the, the, the tourists that come. So uh, on the left-hand side at the bottom, you can see a, a bus that's actually been, it's been fitted with, a, with, a, with an antenna. You probably can't see it. There's a, there's a, there's a skylight um, which is kind of open near, just behind the front, and just behind that, you might just see the, the antenna that's uh, on the roof. So we've fitted out some uh, those buses with antennas, and, uh, and and the idea there is that those buses will be connected uh, uh, to provide various uh, um, uh, applications and benefits, and to demonstrate the, the benefits that, that could come from having those uh, tour buses connected. And actually, we're going to be using uh, dynamic um, spectrum. Uh, access to spectrum sharing to do that. And the basic uh, setup for that is that we'll have uh, our, uh, our base stations, as, we, uh, as you can see in the, in the, in the, the graphic there. And uh, they are going to be, well, they actually are um, controlled by a radio manager, which basically contacts a, uh, well, we used to call it a database, but now we call it spectrum allocation server, uh, um, working with the uh, project partner Fair Spectrum, and that basically is providing the, uh, the, the, the spectral availability. Now, we're kind of making up the spectral availability. We're running all of this under test and develop, development licenses at the moment. As a project, we've got over 20 test and development licenses for Spectrum. Uh, but uh, to demonstrate, the uh, obviously, uh, this would have to be a, a, a regulator-approved um, spectrum allocation server eventually. But for the moment, we can actually just say, well, let's imagine, and that's what we do, we imagine we've got incumbents, licensed users, here, 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 and what does that leave for us to use uh, for, the, uh, for the tour bus um, application? And one thing, uh, just picking up on, on Mansur's point, one thing about spectrum sharing. Spectrum sharing may be dynamic or it may be non-dynamic, and it also may be automated or non-automated. And these are, these are independent, uh, uh, let's say, choices or independent dimensions of the whole thing. And one thing about dynamic, you know, dynamic, uh, on the train example, you've got a train uh, uh, going, go, going from one end, of, or one, one end of the country to the other, and it's kind of maybe dynamically picking up the rights to use spectrum. That's a fast-moving dynamic environment. You couldn't really do that in a non-automated way. You, 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 you wouldn't, you know, the train's kind of going from, say, Glasgow to London as it approaches Birmingham, but they, they, they can't apply for a licence with a, with a form filling up, you know, it's, it's going to be past Birmingham. That's all got to be automated dynamic spectrum. But you can have slower, you know, dynamic can actually be a longer time constant. It could be one, two years, but, but the principle's still the same. You can use the spectrum until the licence holder uh, wants to wants to use it, and you know, then you could potentially talk about that being a manual, manually based, managed uh, administration process, or, or automated, or so on. And there's pros and cons to to, to both, and, and so on. But we've got to be careful when we talk about dynamic, and the time constants in dynamic, and whether or not that whole thing gets managed using an automated or non-automated thing. They're kind of separate and independent variables, actually. Anyway. What do I think is next for dynamic spectrum and, 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 very, and spectrum sharing? Well, and rural. The business models, you know, we've heard so much about that. That is the thing. The, the spectrum alone isn't going to solve the business model challenges, but affordable access to spectrum at least removes uh, some, some hard barriers and allows the business model challenges to at least be explored. Uh, Low-cost hardware, so we've got to reduce the cost. That all feeds into the business models. 
network design and management tools, and more crucially, if we're going to do it uh, with automated uh, approaches, then the automatic network configuration has to be there, because if it's a fast-moving dynamic environment, you're not going to be able to manually adjust your network uh, that fast either. Education and training, this is a new way of doing things, right? So, you know, network designers, network operators, network uh, installers um, all have to uh, be kind of educated with this new way of doing things. The only thing is we haven't really worked out what that new way of doing things is yet, but nevertheless, the whole education and training thing maybe has to be kind of built in, uh, maybe, from, maybe from now, actually. Uh, and, uh, and, of course, regulatory support. Without regulatory support for it, you actually just cannot get access to the spectrum, so the spectrum sharing won't work. And if all of these things kind of line up, if you manage to sort that, then you might just get increased scale and widespread uh, adoption. And that would give you the virtuous circle, which will feed everything else. But it, they all have to kind of line up. They all have to be uh, addressed. Um, so it's a, it's a bit of a challenge. Anyway, so in conclusion... Uh, we certainly believe dynamic spectrum sharing has the potential to yield uh, widespread benefits. There are various deployment models, as we've said, automated, non-automated, you know, that kind of thing. Um, is, is, it, is it dynamic spectrum sharing or is it spectrum sharing in the sense that you're just going to give it to a community or is it a neutral host provider that's going to be sharing the spectrum or is it actually operators that are just... There's various deployment models. Um, and, and incidentally, di different deployment models might suit different scenarios as well. It's not necessarily one deployment model that, that is a one-size-fits-all or anything like that. Um, and of course, there's got to be uh, appropriate regulation and, where appropriate, the, the, the technology, the automatic network configuration technology becomes important as well. But uh, 5G is an opportunity to do things differently. That is our mantra at 5G Rural First. So we have some demos that you're uh, going to see later, uh, or you're going to have the opportunity to see later, and there's various demos there, and uh, some of our project partners uh, here and, and uh, key suppliers are demonstrating dynamic spectrum access and various other things uh, that, that you can have a, a look at a bit later on. Um, our dynamic spectrum access demo, essentially, well, I won't get into this slide, this is basically a spectrum uh, uh, table, but you can, see, you can see all of this out in, in, in the demo. Uh, and finally, you know, we have, we, we have heard, you know, the, the, about the, the difficulties of actually deploying in rural areas, and it is difficult. And uh, what I want to finally uh, do is just uh, leave you with a little 10-second video uh, of uh, one of our guys, Kenny, when he was uh, in one of his recent trips up to Orkney working with CloudNet at one of their, uh, uh, up in the hills at one of their uh, radio uh, sites. And this just will show that it's not... It's not, all about the, it's not all about the radio technologies and the spectrum and the transmit powers and you know, the receive signal strengths and, and all of that kind of stuff. Sometimes it boils down to just basic stuff. And, uh, well, I'll let the... Black. <laughs> well done. Yeah. <laughs> well done. <laughs> So, Kenny's, Kenny's, up, Kenny's up the back there, I think he's thoroughly embarrassed, but well done, Kenny. Sometimes it just boils down to being able to get the car door, car door open. And on that, I will go back to my original statement, rural connectivity is really challenging. Just ask Kenny. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>